Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has placed eternity in man's heart. God has placed eternity in man's heart. If you look across the annals of history, you look at every recorded culture and nation, throughout time people have always worshipped something. And it's because God has placed eternity in man's heart. And as Paul says in that speech on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, verse 27, we are looking for Him. We are seeking God. We are looking for Him. And because He has placed eternity in our hearts and we are looking for Him, you will always find people worshiping something or someone. God wants us, of course, to worship Him and Him alone. Because He alone can fill the needs that we have. But man, often in misguided attempts to worship, have worshipped something less than God. And as we look at our text this morning in Jeremiah chapter 2 and chapter 3, I've selected this text because I feel like it relates well to our study last week in Psalm 119. Last week we noticed that God alone is righteous. And as we look at this text this morning, we're going to see the pale imitations that man have made in an attempt to worship something or someone other than God. It was a problem in Jeremiah's day. But also, I'm reminded as I look at Jeremiah chapter 2 and 3, I'm reminded of the enemies that the psalmist deals with in Psalm 119. The people who were alive in Jeremiah's day continued to reject the Word of God and they persecuted the prophet of God. And I don't know if Jeremiah wrote Psalm 119. We've already looked at some of the other proposals for who wrote that psalm this year. There are people who believe he is the the, uh, author of Psalm 119. But even if he is not, his enemies that persecuted him for declaring the word of the Lord, they remind me of the enemies that appear in Psalm 119. And so for that reason, we're looking this morning at Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 3. If you haven't already opened your Bibles, you can open to chapter 2. As Jeremiah calls upon an idolatrous people, and he says to them, on behalf of God, return to me. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1, is where we will begin in just a moment. And as we look at chapters 2 and 3, I want you to notice with me that God through Jeremiah says, first of all, reject idols. Second of all, remember the Lord, the one true God. And then finally, return to Him. So first of all, we see that Jeremiah tells the people of God to reject idols. And I'm going to look at several verses here in chapter 2 as Jeremiah paints a very vivid picture of the worthlessness of idols. He says in verse 5, this is the word of the Lord, What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? He says that idols... False gods, any god other than the one true God, is worthless. Then in verse 11, he says, Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. So he says that idols are worthless, they are unprofitable, And then we come down in the text and we see in verse 13, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken Me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So they went from living water to wells that could not even hold water. And so idols are worthless. Idols are unprofitable. They are unable to provide for the basic needs of those who worship them. And then verse 28, 
He says, but where are your gods that you made for yourself? Let them arise if they can save you in your time of trouble. For as many as your cities are your gods, O Judah. So they are worthless. They are unprofitable. They are unable to provide. And they cannot save. And so Jeremiah says, you reject them. You reject them. What will they profit you? Now the problem that he deals with in this moment, Jeremiah prophesying to Israel and also speaking of, uh, prophesying really to Judah, but also speaking of the northern kingdom of Israel. He's talking about a problem that has existed for some time. We can go all the way back to the Exodus and we can see that while Moses is on the mountain, we talked about it last week, the people are below him on the ground making a calf to worship uh, an imitation of the gods that they saw in Egypt. We can see it throughout the history of the people when we come into the period of the judges, but they're constantly turning after other gods. We can see it now in Jeremiah's day during the period of the divided kingdom that both Israel and Judah are practicing idolatry and going after other gods. We can see it while the people of God are in captivity in Babylon and they're surrounded by the Babylonian gods and some of them worship those gods. We can see it when God brings the people back and resettles them in the land and instead of worshiping the one true God who brought them out of captivity, they again turn to other gods. We can see it in the days of Jesus when we look at our New Testament and see that the Sadducees worshipped power and wealth and that the Pharisees worshipped prominence and influence. And oh yes, we can see it in our own day that even the people of God today are prone to worshiping that which is other than God. That even we must guard ourselves and recognize the potential idols in our lives. What are some of those? Isaiah 46 verse 7 says, If one cries out to an idol, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. Idolatry, idols cannot save. What are some of the idols that we're prone to worshiping today? Productivity. See, God alone is righteous. We talked about it last week. Often what we're doing when we're worshiping an idol is attempting to find justification. We're attempting to declare that we are right and that our existence is right. And one of the ways that we do that is we think that we've got to be so productive that in the use of our time, it's about how much we can produce. And certainly, as God's people, we're given the responsibility of stewardship, and that includes our time and our talents, and that means we can't people be people who just sit around and do nothing, but we can make productivity an idol in which we believe that we are only justified in existing and we are only right with God if we produce so much. And it becomes an idol for us. Or you can look at our culture and certainly see that it has influenced the church that romantic love is an idol. It is a false god in our culture and it has infected the church. How many times have you seen a Christian, an adult, mature Christian walking a good Christian life, but other people in the church doubt that Christian because he or she has chosen not to marry? We think something is wrong. We have these little suspicions about them because we worship romantic love. And we think that only whole people, only people who are whole are married. Or or only whole people can get married. And you can't be whole unless you have a romantic relationship. And we seek to justify ourselves. Does God want His people to enter into God-honoring marriages? Of course He does. But you know, Jesus didn't get married. Paul's ministry took place while he was either widowed or unmarried. And we've made romantic love a God in our culture. 
We've made pleasure and politics gods in our culture. I want you to hear me well, Christian. The degree to which we put our trust in politics is a direct relation to the degree to which we've actually put our trust in God. It's the problem we talked about on Sunday morning in the class on 1 Samuel. Hope does not come from Democrats or Republicans. The best possible life is not lived in a democracy or a dictatorship, but in the kingdom of God. But we can see. Many people have put their focus and their trust and their hope in politics. And it for them becomes a God. And then there's, then there's a Psalm 146 verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. Some have made pleasure a God. In Rome, it was bread and circuses. In America, it's social media and sports. And social media has fed the desire for pleasure, whether that pleasure comes from food or sex or the dopamine hit that we get from receiving likes and shares and retweets. And we've made pleasure a God. You know what's so fascinating to me? Adam and Eve were in paradise. Could you conceive of a better situation on this created earth than the situation of Adam and Eve? They had all that they needed. God supplied for them everything that they needed. And they still went after pleasure. But what they sought in the forbidden fruit can only be found in God. So idolatry is alive and well today and it is even present in God's church today. And so as we think about Jeremiah's words here in Jeremiah 2, in which he makes it clear that idolatry is worthless, it is unprofitable, it is unable to save, we need to evaluate our own hearts. And we need to take a close look and examine ourselves and ask, what is sitting on the throne? Because productivity won't get you to heaven. Romantic love, politics, pleasure. You know what they all offer? Temporary fulfillment. And often it's extremely temporary. Momentary fulfillment. It is only God and God alone that can fill our needs. And so Jeremiah says, reject. Reject idols. Second of all, he says, remember the Lord. Look again at chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through where no man dwells? And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. So he freed them. He freed them from bondage in Egypt. And He brought them safely through the treacherous wilderness. Verse 20 says, For long ago I broke your yoke and burst your bonds, but you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and under every green tree you bowed down like a prostitute. And He settled them, verse 7, in a land of abundance and plenty. And then, verse 32 
He asked the question. Here's what I've done for you. I broke your bonds. I brought you out of slavery. I brought you through a treacherous place, the wilderness, and into a place where you didn't even have to build the houses and you didn't even have to plant the trees, but all the abundance was already there. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. I did all of this for you and how could you forget me? That's what he says in verse 32. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride, her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. But you know what? God knew this was going to happen. He knew that His people would forget Him. We talked last week in the sermon about the nature of the word forget and the word remember in the Old Testament. This is not just about recalling information. This is about acting. And when you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, I made a shameless plug last week for the Sunday morning Bible class. I'm going to make one now for the Wednesday night Bible class. We're studying the book of Deuteronomy and you'll see these things if you'll join us on Wednesday nights. But you look through the book of Deuteronomy and it is full of the language of remembering and forgetting. Deuteronomy chapter 8, the entire chapter is about this. And if you turn over there for just a moment with me, I'm not going to read all of these verses, but I want to note just a few things. It, it appears before verse 11, but we're going to start at verse 11. He says, Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes which I command you today. When you've eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Verse 18 says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may confirm His covenant that He swore to your fathers as it is this day. But listen to verse 19. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. And then you go over just a few chapters in Deuteronomy to chapter 18 and verse 9, and you find God counseling His people, don't go after the idols in the land. Don't do it. And then you go over just a few more chapters to chapter 28, and the entire chapter is about the blessings and the curses that come from remembering Him and keeping His law. And then you get near to the end of the book in chapter 31 verse 20, and He says, When I have brought them into this land flowing with milk and honey, they will turn to other gods and serve them and despise Me and break My covenant. God knew He was going to forget them. God knew that they were going to forget Him rather. He knew that they were going to forget Him. I think it's in our nature. Forgetful. Not, not where my keys are. Not where I put the checkbook. The only way that we will be people who remember is if we take the time to focus. We have to actively focus. And in this case, we have to actively focus on the goodness of God. His historic goodness towards us. Jeremiah calls up all of the goodness of God towards the people of Israel. That He brought them out of slavery. He brought them into a good land. All of these things. What about the goodness that God has done for you and me? Sometimes we pray. Usually we pray. Thank you, Lord some, some manner of speaking, above all else for your Son Jesus, who gave His life for us. That, that's a good thing to pray. It's important that we keep the sacrifice of Jesus in the forefront of our minds at all times. But I fear, sometimes that has become an empty repetition. The thing about saying the same words sometimes over and over and over and over again is they begin to lose their punch. And so I think about you and me as Christians, and maybe we should rethink the way that we remember the goodness of God. I don't mean that we quit thinking about Jesus or His sacrifice, 
But maybe we need to do more than simply say thank you for sending your Son, but focus on the depth and the breadth of that gift in our prayers. Thank you, God, for your humility in sacrificing the perfection of heaven to come and live among sinners among whom I am chief. You left it all. You left the best possible setting to live among men. And I know how poor men can be because I'm the worst. That's what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'm the chief among sinners. I think you and I would probably say the same. So we thank you God for your humility. We thank you God for your mercy in giving up your life for followers whose spirits are willing but flesh is weak. We thank You that You know that we are weak and yet You came among us to give Yourself on our behalf. It is only by Your mercy that we can look upon You and thank You. We thank You for Your love. For loving us when we were Your enemies. For loving us when we were serving a Master that is opposed to You and us. We thank You for Your love. We thank You, God, for Your salvation. When we were wandering in darkness, You came as the light into the world to open our eyes and turn us away from the deceit of the enemy. We thank You for Your salvation. We've got to remember the Lord and His goodness. We've got to intentionally focus our thoughts and our hearts on what He has done for us. It is not enough simply to pray, thank you for your Son, if we don't realize what that means. I think we have often cheapened the Gospel and the immensity of God's goodness. We thank you, God. If we would return to the Lord, we must contrast His historic goodness toward His people with the worthlessness of idols. Jeremiah says, return. Return to the Lord by rejecting idols, by remembering the Lord's goodness. And finally, when we return, it must be to the Lord. Look again at Jeremiah now in chapter 3, beginning here at verse 12. He says, go and proclaim these words to the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt, that you rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors among foreigners and under every green tree, and that you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, O faithless children, declares the Lord, for I am your master. I will take you one from a city and two from a family and I will bring you to Zion and I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And then verse 22, Return, O faithless sons, I will heal your faithlessness. We come to you, behold, for you are the Lord our God. And then chapter 4, verse 1, If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me you should return. To me, you should return. You see, in chapter 3, verse 10, we learn that the southern kingdom of Judah had pretended to return, but they had not really returned. And so he chastises them. And then he gives them a pattern. He lays out the pathway of return. And you can see it here in these verses. In chapter 4, verse 1, it is clear that the return must be to the Lord, not to a pale imitation of Him. Not to some other God. Not to a God that we have crafted in our own image. But to Him and to Him alone. And then he says, if you're going to return to Me, you must be fully dependent upon My mercy. It is not your merit. It is not by what you have earned that you will be able to return. He says, but it will be according to My mercy that you are able to return. That's in chapter 3, verse 12. And then he says, if you're going to return, you've got to confess. You've got to admit that you are guilty of sin. That's in verse 13 of chapter 3. And then finally, he says in verses 14 and 15, if you're going to return to me, 
return to me as master, and I will give you faithful leaders. This is the pathway of returning to the Lord. God has laid it out. He has not left His people without instruction. When we have wandered away from Him, He tells us how we can come back to Him and to Him alone. Now there are some here who don't realize that they've turned away from the Lord. Every one of us is born innocent. And every one of us at some point in our life turns away from Him by our sin. And for the one who has never obeyed the Gospel, coming back to the Lord means believing that Jesus is the Christ. Turning away from sin, confessing Jesus as Master, and being immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. And you are at home with the Lord. For those who are the people of God, who have obeyed the gospel, returning looks a lot like what you see there on the screen. We've got to, first of all, recognize and reject the idols that we've allowed to creep into our lives since we've obeyed the gospel. We've got to remember the Lord's goodness towards us and bringing us from the darkness into the light. And then we've got to understand that when we come back, it's not because we've earned our way back, but it's because of His mercy. And we have to confess. That is part of it. We have to admit specifically to God that we have sinned and we recognize that what we have done is sin. And then we have to allow Him again to be Lord and Master over us where we have turned away from Him. Lamentations 3, verse 40. In my daily Bible reading, I had circled this passage. I said, there's going to come a day when this is going to appear in an invitation. So here it is. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. That's not my invitation. That's the Lord's invitation. If you need to respond to it, won't you come now? as we stand and as we sing together.